Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 307. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because I have a feeling that today we're going to answer a question you've been asking. You may be asking silently, you may have been asking loudly, but I think you've been asking. You say, what's that question? Well, some of you might right now be driving on the way to work. Some of you might be wondering, is there a way out. You're like, I've got a really nice job, It's, but I just want out. I want to find a way to not do this anymore because I have these things burning inside of me that I would rather go out there and build my own thing. Well, I have with me today a gentleman who's been able to do that and significantly more because he's been the CFO of a company you may have heard of by the name of Zilp. Realty, and you probably uh, have heard of many of the different industries that he's been a part of. He's been inside of the hotel and resorts and hospitality, and we're talking consumer internet. He's been around the block, as they say, and more importantly, he's taken all this experience to create his own thing, and he's going to tell us about it today. So help me welcome none other than Gary Beasley. Gary, are you there? I am, Jay. Thanks. How are you Good doing? I'm doing great. How are you Good. doing? So far, so good. So far, so good. But I know that we've got a lot of questions for you. And I've got to ask you the first question because everybody gets the same first question when they get here the first time. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. (laughs) All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Batman, Robin, Superman, Wonder Woman, etc. And I think superheroes and entrepreneurs have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, uh, we occasionally get dressed up and we maybe we put on an imaginary cape and tights and we go out there and we take our product or service to the marketplace and to the world and try to save the people we call customers. And I also believe just like Superman and just like Wonder Woman, just like all of these individuals, before they were known as we know them today, they had an ordinary life. They had an origin story. They had a beginning. So... Before you were out there uh, making the difference in the real estate market, before helping uh, companies inside the resort and hotel industries, before doing a lot of, uh, I think, what you called the cross-section of technology and real estate and just being there the way that you have, we want to know is, who is Gary Beasley? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my background, I, I, I come from a small town actually in the Midwest in, in Indiana. And so um, I, I guess I, I grew up, um, I was fortunate enough not to have a lot of financial resources, but to have a great family and a situation where I was able to really learn, I think, the the, the payoff of, of hard work and uh, being able to achieve, uh, you know, pretty much whatever you want uh, if you really put forth the effort. And, you know, a lot of times in my life I've been told no. And, and you know, as a successful entrepreneur, you need to you need to be able to look past that and get 99 no's and, and get to the one yes. And um, so I, I guess that that's sort of who I am. I, I like building businesses. I like working on teams, working with people. Um and I, I, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who just wants to to sail a ship that's already headed in a certain direction and clip coupons. Like, you know, I was running a public company before this, which was wonderful. It was a great experience to build a company privately and take it public. 
But running a public company was not as fun and not as interesting as building businesses, uh, I have found, uh, the way I'm wired. So that's, that's really why I, I left that and, and dove into um, a startup, with, uh, you know, which we got some venture capital to start. It was you know, just, just me and my, my co-founder and, mm-hmm. uh, and a business idea. Love it. I love it because you're actually coming from a place where most people are trying to get, <laughs> which I find very, very interesting. But there's something you said at the beginning that I, I don't know if enough people were actually paying attention. You said you were fortunate enough to not have come from financial resources. Please expound upon that a little more. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, oftentimes um, if people grow up entitled, um, they don't make the connection between hard work and and success. If you're sort of born into success, I, I think oftentimes it's a bit of a curse. I happen to you know go to college with a number of people who came from money who ended up not being very successful um, it be, because it, they, they always knew that there was that safety net and motivation. And so, so f- for me, uh, I actually, <laughs> you know, ironically do view it as a blessing, I think, uh, to, to come up really without any, any safety net and any resource. I knew I had to make it on my own. And, um, that was, I found it very, very motivating. And then when you do get a little bit of success, uh, it's extremely rewarding. You feel like you really deserved it. And, I, I found it um, the you know incrementally as you get a little bit more and more success you build confidence around it because I think the other thing that happens is if you do uh, if you do co- sort of come from a, a position where you don't you already have made it you, you don't get that self validation and so I ironically I think a lot of the people who have that um, it, some people may say being fortunate being born into that circumstance never develop the self confidence that you get if you actually do it yourself. Interesting. I like your position on this. Now, I'm curious to know, what would you say to someone? uh, Because we we deal with a number of would-be entrepreneurs, people who want to get started. So let's pretend that someone listening right now is is saying, yeah, but 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 Gary, if I just had the money, I would be able to do my 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 business. What would you say to that person? Well, I would say that there's always money out there. for the right idea and the right entrepreneur. Um, so it's, it's not, um, it, now you, you can't necessarily start a business that is hugely capital intensive and have, uh, you know, if you don't have any resources to get started, but I think a lot of times if it's a really well thought out plan, there, there's a lot you can do to prove out a concept with little or no money. And th- there are plenty of, um, angel investors who will back an entrepreneur with a business plan um, before the business is even started if if you have the skills and the vision that they believe can can pull together are really interesting uh, necessarily a requirement to start a lot of businesses in fact what I have found is oftentimes investors like the scrappy entrepreneur um, <laughs> who's going to work so hard because um, uh, that that individual needs the money so badly and is not going to take um, no for an answer and is going to find a way to be successful and oftentimes be successful you know with a you know smaller amount of money if they know they just it's just have a little bit to work with as opposed to um, you know a big fat checkbook. Yeah, uh, agreed. And and I had a mentor once who said that money. He and he was just very direct. He said money makes people stupid. <laughs> it's like, look, when you when you yeah. when you have it, you don't try to do anything differently. You don't necessarily innovate or create anything because you just you just go buy it and you're done. Um, I'm curious to know if the how you have seen your your background play into your ability to build businesses, build teams, and, and possibly see angles that others might not see? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think over, over one's life and one's career, you, you develop um, certain ways of, of looking at the world, certain ways of interacting with people and solving problems. And I, I guess I have always um, been a pretty collaborative uh, person, I, I enjoy kind of a team environment and 
have always sort of tried to pay it forward and done things for people without expect you know expecting anything in return. And I've just, for whatever reason, was raised that way. And what I've always found is that has come back many, many times over where oftentimes it, you know, people are trying to, if, if someone asks a favor or asks for an introduction, they're looking for some sort of compensation or, well, what, you know, what are you going to give me if you do that? I, I've just never done that in my, in my career or my life. And it's worked out really well. Um, so I, th I think a lot of it is just trying to live your life the right way and being sort of, um, uh, you know, a, 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 try to be a good person and, and try to be straightforward with people and, and, um, and work hard. Um, and the rest sort of t takes, takes care of itself. And, and so for me, I like to, I like to think that, uh, if you build the right relationships, um, you, you have to be smart enough, um, for sure. But, the, but I think emotional intelligence is more important, uh, in many cases for being successful than just pure intellect. And so you can, you can be extremely smart, um, and, and be successful. Uh, that's, I'm not saying you can't, but I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs who, um, are, you know, have really high kind of social IQ and can navigate situations, can, can think on their feet, can negotiate, um, can build coalitions. Um, I think it, you know, can, can tell a story, can really kind of get behind their idea and sell it oftentimes better than somebody who might be, um, smarter, um, but, but might not have those kind of skills to kind of, kind of pull it all together. Um, it's, it's very hard to be a good entrepreneur. You have to do a lot of things, um, pretty, pretty well, which is why it's so hard to start businesses and make them successful. But I think also knowing what you're what you're not good at as well as what you're good at is is very important and being being good at, at getting the right people around you to fill in those gaps and then treating those people as your partners and and, um, you know, building, like I say, a, a team where everybody brings something unique to the party, is, I think, is 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 really important. No, nobody there's you know, there's there's nobody who's got all the answers. Um, and I think that's also been uh you know, part of the way that I've built my career that's, that's, that's certainly helped. Got it. Got it. Now it might sound a little off. I'm just curious. Did you play a sport uh, growing up? I, I played a number of sports. Yeah. I, I grew up in Indiana. So of course I played basketball. That's like requirement, right? It, it is. <laughs> it is requirement. I played baseball also, but, but in high school I, I uh, discovered golf. And so I actually played on my high school golf team um, for four years as well. And so I'm, I'm still, an avid golfer. Got it. Got it. I was just one. I was wondering how much team sports were because uh, just as I listened to you, um, I know that the education system as it's currently structured doesn't exactly reward collaboration in the same way that it's necessary. And I was like, he's got to have played a sport or two in it. I'm betting it's a team sport. And I just I had to ask to find out. Yep. No, it's been it was a you know, big part of I think my childhood and sort of seeing the success of, of teams where you, you know, you have, uh, might not be as talented as, as the team you're playing, <laughs> but, which, and we oftentimes weren't the most talented, but we usually had a pretty good game plan and, and everyone worked hard. And right. so you sort of start to make those connections. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Now there's something you said that I, I want to key on. You said it, it, an entrepreneur has to be good at many things, <laughs> which is very true. And you, it, it made, you made reference to it being difficult to get a, a business off the ground, a difficult to get it started, which leads me to the thought process. How does someone, you know, like yourself, you 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 had been working in corporate America for a significant period of time. You did the you know Northwestern University. You you did Stanford School of Business. You did these things. You were on this path. And yet you've managed to develop the courage to leave that behind and go do your own thing. A lot of people are stuck right there and unable to do it. Please explain where your courage comes from. <laughs> I don't know if it's courage or, or stupidity. Everyone, <laughs> right. I mean, probably a little, you have to have a little bit of both. Um, you know, a number of people thought I was crazy to leave my last job. Um, well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It, yeah. We're talking to public company. People are trying to become yeah, yeah. that. And you're like, nah, I don't want that. 
Well, you know, it's you know, in many ways, it's 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 a wonderful thing, and it was a good a good life experience. I actually feel like I could go back and do that again at some point in my life, um, and and maybe be you know better at it, uh, doing it a, a second time, um, maybe later in my career with even more entrepreneurial experience. Um, but what I what I um, what I didn't enjoy about it was uh, we were at a point where. The, the business largely stopped innovating and it was all about sort of delivering quarterly numbers. Um, and what I found was 80% of my day was spent talking about, um, talking about our business and rationalizing what we're doing. And it's sort of, it, it, you know, sort of explaining what we're doing to, um, investors and analysts and, and traveling to around in investor conferences and telling the same story, uh, giving, presentations all day and 12 meetings a day with the same uh, pitch book. And it just, it, it was fine in many respects and important, an important thing to do. But what I realized, I, I felt like every day that I was doing that was a day that I wasn't creating something. And, um, so, so when we came up with the idea to, to start Roofstock, I, I, something just flipped in my, in my mind and said, wow, as I started to, I found I was started thinking about thinking about starting the business and what I would do and why that might be a better thing for me to do at this point in my career than, you know, run this large company. In many ways, I loved, you know, I, I loved the, the fact we had 600 people and we had a great corporate culture and the business was doing quite well. So all that was great. But you know, there are not that many times in life when you could actually create something from scratch that could make a difference and change the way people do things. And, and I, I actually think I'm, if, you know, when we look at what we're good at and what we're maybe not as good at, I think, you know, I'm pretty good at, at building teams and starting things and, and, and coming up with new ideas and trying to implement them in all the different things around there. And those skills were being wasted in my old role. I think there's a lot of people who could run public companies very well. Um, in many, I don't want to say that's an easy job, but it's, it's a, <laughs> it's cause it's not, but it's a different job where, um, you, it doesn't take as much creativity, um, to, to do. And there are, I think a lot of people who are perhaps better suited their, their personality and their, their goals are better suited to, to doing that. And could be perfectly content uh, just sort of um, doing that year after year, and it's and it's great. I mean, so it's, it's a fine way to to you know to live a life and, and build a career. And again, maybe I go do that later in my life. But this is more uh, for me and where I am in my life and career, much more exciting. Um, there's a chance to build um, a, an organization and a company and kind of change the way you know. In this case, real estate is bought and sold using the internet and, you know, kind of, uh, creating, you know, a really disruptive business model where I'd like to be able to look back in five or 10 years and say, wow, you know, I, you know, I started that company and then we, we built something that is, is pretty significant. Um, and that there's a, a lot of sort of, you know, just psychic income I get from that mm. in addition to hopefully building wealth and, and, you know, creating a company that, that, makes money for our investors and our, and our, you know, employees. But there's that, that element beyond the financial that I think for many entrepreneurs is, is really important. It's just this idea of creating something. Indeed. Yet I, I must ask more deeply because I know someone is listening who wants to do exactly what you're you're talking about? In fact, I, I don't know if you you plan on re-listening to this, but your tone of voice even changed when you started talking about the prior thing and how you. It, it was pretty interesting for me to hear it. I'm like, oh wow! And you're way more excited, and I can hear it when you start talking about rootstock. It's really really present <laughs> uh, there, and I think that's great. But I also think there's a number of other people who feel exactly that way. Their tone of voice is changing every time they start talking about what they're currently doing, but they keep doing it because they can't figure out or develop the courage to go, okay, I'm going to make this happen. So if if I don't ask again, they're going to send me a hate mail saying, Jay, I didn't hear how he was able to develop the courage and actually go. And what did he do? What was the steps to actually 
say, I mean, some of them are married because they're going home. They're like, hey, honey, guess what? I want to leave this thing we've gotten comfortable with behind and go do this new thing. How do you make that happen? Yeah, well, I I, well, I do have a, a very supportive wife who uh, fortunately was very supportive. And she, she it's funny, Jay, she said the same thing that you said when I started talking to her about this business idea. She said, you should go do it because you're obviously so excited about it. I could just tell by the tone of your voice that <laughs> you know this is what you, you need to do. And so I, I think that what allowed me to take the leap was one, that, that, that she was obviously supportive, but... Um, I just I I think whenever somebody looks at this, you have to get comfortable with the downside. And mm. I said, well, what? Because there, there's no way of knowing at any given time whether a decision was right or not. You really don't even know in retrospect because you don't know how your old thing would have ended up going, right? So right. Um, you have to sort of be comfortable with the scenarios where it doesn't work. And and I was you know, I got myself comfortable with that. And I think a lot of us are the, the fear when you really kind of break it down. Um, what's what's the fear? Um, you can't get another job. Um, I think if you're qualified and you're you know reasonably good at what you're doing, and you leave to start something, and it the worst case is it doesn't work, and you're not able to raise money to continue it, and you you chalk it up to a life experience, and then you go back. And you package, you dust yourself up, back off, and and you you go back and you get another job. And um, th- I mean that that's ca- kind of how I looked at it. I said, well, if the worst thing that could happen is I go try this and it doesn't work, and in a, a year or two I come back and I I get another job, or I try to start something else if I've still got the the energy in me to do it, then that's you know that's a decent downside. Um, and the upside is it works. And then there's all these degrees of how well it works and on many levels. So you, you don't get the, the disproportionate reward without taking some risk, right? So you, ha- you ha- in my view, you, you, have to, you have to leave something uh, to perhaps um, find, you know, leave something very good to perhaps find something great sometimes. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's, you, you, you know, again, I think this perhaps comes from humble, beginnings and, and, and all that. And I, I have a, you know, I, 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 I'm, I didn't grow up with this sense of entitlement or feeling like, um, I was always going to have money. So when you, when you do that, it gives you confidence that you could go, you could go get another job and it, everything's going to be okay. Um, and I don't know. So it's that, that's sort of how I looked at it, got comfortable with the downside and made the leap. Excellent. Well, Hey, that's, the, if that's the strategy for some, then that that if it worked for you. Maybe it'll work for someone who's also listening. Now, let's switch uh, tack a little bit and tell us what is because we've said it a couple of times. We've hinted at it. We haven't exactly told everybody what is roof stock. And now I'm still going to make you wait just a little bit longer to find out what roof stock is. But here's what I will say. In Every marketplace, regardless of what product or service you want to sell, there's many different types of customers. And there's always the customer who is wanting to to, to learn to do it themselves, the DIY person. There's the person who wants parts of it done for them so that they can then carry it across the finish line to victory. And then there's the part, there's the other person who wants all of it done for them. Think about that as it relates to your business and or real estate, and you'll be able to see many different ways to use real estate because it's one thing to go out there to buy it. It's another to know what you're going to do with it once you have it because there is no one size fits all if you haven't figured that out already. Anyway, let's get back to Gary and figure out what is Roofstock. So Roofstock is a it's a marketplace and transaction platform for real estate. Yeah, and specifically it's investment properties and we're starting with single family rental homes. So we've built a, a platform that will allow investors uh, to buy and sell leased rental homes with tenants in place. So you can go onto our site and buy a home that's that's already cash flowing and um, that's a big deal because it's it's if if for those uh, listeners out there who who own rental properties have thought about it, um, typically you have to go out and you have to find a vacant property. Oftentimes it needs some renovation. You have to find a a, a tenant for it, 
a property manager. You have to get it leased up. And there's a lot of um, a lot of work that goes into that and, and some risk associated with it. Where what, what you can do on roof stock is simply buy it much more like a, a stock or a bond. It's already got a, a tenant in there. You could see what the current cash flow is and you could buy it in an online environment. And so it's very, we're opening up kind of, um, we're just sort of separating, if you will, investing from operations. So you don't need to manage this property yourself. It's managed professionally for you by a local property manager. Um, you just need to figure out how much money you want to allocate into that strategy. And there's financing available and there are investment advisors we have on staff who could, who could talk to you about the, the various options. And it's a way to get direct exposure um, to real estate and, and earn current cash flow and, and ride along for the potential home price appreciation. So we're just opening up this asset class, which, by the way, is a large, large segment of the housing stock. It's about 10% of the housing stock. So it's about $2 trillion of assets are rented homes. Wow. And uh, until roof stock, there really hasn't been a way for these to trade efficiently. Um, So the, 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 the idea of selling a home with a tenant in place is not necessarily a new one. It does happen occasionally, but it's largely portfolios of homes that get packaged up and sold to investors. But the current MLS uh, infrastructure is designed very well to sell vacant homes to owner occupants, but it doesn't it doesn't really work generally very well to sell leased homes. It's not it, it's not really set up for income properties like a commercial uh, property marketing uh, uh, regime would be. So um, anyway, as a seller, if you think about it, the advantage is you never have to vacate the home. You could put it on roof stock. We charge a fraction of what traditional brokers charge, and you keep the income right up until the day it sells, and then um, a new buyer comes in, buys the property, and you, and so you save money on the commission. There's no lost rent because it's it's leased right up until the day it's sold, and you don't have any any expenses associated with getting a property ready for sale, fixing it up, et cetera, to put it on the MLS. So that typically costs 10 to 12 percent of the value of a home if you if you as an owner try to vacate it, you wait for the lease to run out, um, you renovate it, you put it on the and list it uh, between the commission and the lost rent um, in the CapEx. So it's a and we charge typically two and a half percent to our sellers. So it's really a two and a half percent versus a 10 or 12 percent cost to sellers. And then our buyers can come in and we just charge a modest uh, marketplace fee. Uh, of 50 basis points. So a half a percent is what we charge buyers. And for that, you get full use of our platform. There there are other platforms out there that charge, you know, seven times what we charge literally. Um, But it's, it's because we're, we're, we're very efficient about what we do. We're trying to keep the costs down for investors um, because ultimately if, if, you pay a lot of fees and you kind of get loaded up on costs. It hurts your returns. And what we're trying to do is generate, uh, a, create a, pl- a marketplace where investors can get really, really good returns because that's what's going to make make it work for both sides. And then sort of where the magic happens is because we charge so much less for sellers, they're willing to sell it for less money. And buyers can come in and buy properties because sellers are selling it for less money. They feel like, and they are getting good deals, so we're, we're finding that um, there's, there's a really nice match there where really the, the savings that we're squeezing out, a lot of the friction and transaction costs gets sort of shared by buyers and sellers, and that's creating some nice momentum uh, for the business. Got it. Got it. Totally like this idea uh, where you're going, but 50 basis points? Did anyone ever like go, are you crazy? Yeah, we we met with a potential investor last week who said, "You've got to be kidding me! You're giving your services away." I said, "You know what? It's um, we're 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 getting we're getting paid principally by the seller, so we're getting a couple points on the sell side, two and a half points. So all in, we're getting three percent, which is plenty for our model because we're we're doing a lot of volume. What we don't want to do is create barriers for buyers because." Because this is a new way of buying. If you if you really think about it, you're buying these homes sight unseen, which you know in many ways seems crazy. Well, why would I buy a home sight unseen? Well, because you might want to be you're living in San Francisco or 
you're, you're, you, you live in Denver or you live in Cleveland and you're buying a home in Orlando. Um, but you can, you can go onto our site and take a virtual 3D tour, um, look at valuation work, look at all the financial projections, look at a full inspection report. Every, everything you need is right there that you could review before actually buying the property. Otherwise, in a trip, typical environment, you have to do all that stuff, a lot of that stuff after you get it under contract and you have a, you know, inspection period and things like that. So we're turning the whole real estate process on its head and making it such that you can invest in these homes really from anywhere in the world on a level playing field with anybody else. You've got, everyone's got the same information. And the reason we're doing it this way is if you think about one of the challenges of selling leased homes is they're occupied. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I was thinking that. You but can't go ahead. Show, right, you can't do showing. So what we do is we found a local company that does uh, an animated tour of the interior. If you go onto our site and you do one of the three D tours, you will see you could you fly through the home and you see what the home looks like without furniture in it. So we were able to it, it basically with a a little iPad and a robot takes a, a you know a perfect interior image of the home and, st- and, and puts it in an animated version. So you could see what the floor plan looks like and there's a 3D floor plan you could see along with it. And then we have the inspection reports. And so by, by having what the layout is and the condition of the property and, and factoring all that into the list price, you really don't need to get inside the homes. What we found, I bought thousands of homes in my last uh, company. When I left, I think we had about 15,000 homes in our portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the only reason we would need to get inside of them was to see how much work they needed and, and whether it was a decent floor plan. Because these are investment homes. Uh, they're, they're three bedroom, two bath, pretty plain vanilla properties. Um, you're much more concerned about the cash flow than the, the color of the kitchen cabinets, <laughs> right? And so w- when my co-founder Gregor and I started at, just disaggregating all of the different pieces, we realized these are the only two things we really need to solve um, it's remotely and then everything else investors should, should, and could be able to do from their desktop. And so with the inspections and the 3d tours, uh, we've, we've gotten it such that all the only time we disturb the tenants is once we'll go through and we'll have our broker walk through it. We'll have the inspector go through and do the inspection report. We'll have the 3d map being taken. And so we disturb the tenant for about an hour and then we leave and then we do all of our work and then the, it, it shows up on the website and they're not disturbed by showings. And if the property doesn't sell, it's uh, no harm, no foul to the, the existing owner because that person or that that company is still getting the income and they still and they don't have an unhappy tenant Or if we were bringing people through all the time and having open houses and things like that, the tenants might be upset. And they might move out. And so that was one of the things we had to solve, both because it was helpful for our, our buy side customers, but as important for the people looking to sell leased homes, they didn't want us to be bothering their tenants. So it, it really, we were doing it for both parties. Got it. Absolutely makes perfect sense. So for those that are uh, in the process, say, of, well, here's what I know. I know there's a more than one individual listening to you right now who would like to find out more information, they probably have some property that they might want to get rid of, or maybe want to take that uh, next step. What's going to be the best way for them to track down what you guys are doing? Maybe uh, sell some property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. I, I would I would encourage them to check out our website. It's a simple address. It's just roofstock.com, just how it sounds, R-O-O-F-S-T-O-C-K.com. Um, we have a number of things you could do there. You could just get started now and just start searching. It's called browse roofs, which is seeing all of our inventory we have for sale. We also, um, have, if you're interested in, in learning more about some of the other uh, solutions we have, uh, we have investment funds that you could invest in. So you could go under our investment solutions tab and click real estate funds and you could see what kind of funds we're offering. And with those that the idea there is, Some people want to buy individual properties or a collection of properties and have their own portfolio and others may just want to take some money and invest it directly into a portfolio of homes and and not own title to the individual homes, but just have essentially an investment in a fund. 
And um, so we, we do that as well. And so you can, you can, you can check that out. Um, you can look under our services tab and we do have, we offer 10, 1031 exchange program. So you could exchange out of other types of real estate into our homes. You could sell, for example, a small apartment building and, and roll the money in tax free into a portfolio of homes we could construct for you. Um, there's financing available. You could learn about financing options. You can borrow uh, typically up to 80% of the value of these homes as an individual investor uh, through a Fannie Mae program, very attractive rates, 30 year fixed, kind of in the threes, the sub 4% um, uh, interest, which is a wonderful program. You could invest through your IRA. Um, so all these you could learn about um, through our website. I encourage you to just go, uh, go kind of poke around and then if you'd like to, we have a tab, you could talk to one of our advisors, shoot us an email, chat, give us a call, and we're, we're happy to uh, answer any questions you have. Excellent. Excellent. Now, final question here. For those that are thinking about becoming a, an entrepreneur, building their cash flow, wanting to get started, they've got that idea that they think is the next billion dollar idea, or maybe even million dollar. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, occasionally they're, they're, you know, if you will, they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They think they want to get started. And I, here's what I, my experience has been when we tend to think of things that we want to do to make us better, make us bigger, make us that much more influential. We always have that voice that comes to us. That's in the back of our head. And occasionally for some, we're related to that voice. And we hear it a lot uh, when we're trying to, to make that next move. And we're not quite sure it's always there, consistently present, and occasionally it feels like it's in the way and won't go away. My question to you uh, is, let's pretend for a moment that the person listening is actually going to do exactly what you suggest. What would you tell them to do in order to make their cash flow build and dream happen? I would say um, you, you have to... Uh, I, I'd say go for it would be my <laughs> my advice. Um, but that's once you've made that decision, and then say once you make the 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 decision to go for it, go all in. Don't don't stick one don't stick one toe in. Um, don't be tentative. Uh, I would say if you're going to be tentative, don't do it at all. But um, you, what you have to do is is come to that that decision, and then once you get there, you you have to fully embrace it. You can't look back. You, you, there are going to be many dark days and where if you allow yourself, you'll say, wow, why did I leave the boat? Um, you, you can't let yourself go there because it's just not constructive and, and you just keep working and, and don't take no for an answer. And, uh, you know, you'd be surprised how many people will, will, you know, when, when hearing a, a few no's will say, well, gosh, these guys must be right. This, this doesn't make any sense. But eventually, if you're committed to it, and if and if you really do believe, and and you can, and you're right that the idea has merit, you'll get there. And that's so. That's what I would say. It's this grit and persistence that I think we're all trying to teach our kids. Um, I think oftentimes today, um, kids are a little bit coddled, and 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 often, you know, I think that's one of the hardest things to teach kids. Uh, is to keep that persistence. And I, I think that's a quality that's not just for kids, but, you know, ultimately for all of us, that is probably as important as anything. It makes perfect sense. It's not going to be handed to you. I can <laughs> completely get it. Oh, uh, with that being said, I definitely appreciate all the inroads you guys are making and the challenge that you are taking on and how you are letting technology revolutionize what it is that's happening inside the real estate world. I, I've, I love, I'm still shocked at the 50 basis points, but hey, uh, you've done the math. If it works, uh, guys, that's code for go buy because that's really, really inexpensive. And uh, I applaud you guys for taking that challenge on and making it easier for more people to actually begin to realize their dream as it relates to being involved inside of real estate, sir. All right, Jay, thank you. I, I really appreciate the time. It was great talking to you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. You know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means you probably should go over to roofstock.com. You know you heard something that you're like, I need to do that. What does that mean? Do it now. As in right now. As in, yes, you're on the mobile device already. 
go ahead. It's RoofStock.com. Make it happen. Why? Because now is the cheapest real estate it's ever going to be. Ten years from now, it's just all going to be more expensive. You might as well get started today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.